All right. Well, Mayuk, it's so nice to finally meet you. Likewise. Thank you so much for having me. I feel it's it's been a long time coming. At least I in my head, so. Oh, me too. I feel like I know you. I mean, I feel like I've been following you forever. Um, and I really admire all the work that you do, and I'm jealous of all your awards and oh. accolades. <laughs> <laughs> That's very sweet. Thank you. I, likewise, I admire you, and I feel like we have a lot of uh, topical interests in common in terms of, uh, you know, like entertainment, let's say, and uh -huh. food thing, of course, but we'll dive into that, I'm sure, uh, over the course of this session. So, <laughs> Well, it's funny because I was telling my, so my husband's a filmmaker, and I was telling him last night that uh, you were also a film writer. And so we watched your Criterion. We went on the Criterion app and we watched your interview. Ah! It was it was so great. We loved it. It was fantastic. Oh, very sweet. Thanks. I have to be honest with you. Um, I'm saying this publicly for the first time. That, so that was recorded like two years ago. Um, and I was just like so nervous that day. I was late to that whole thing. And so like I was super frazzled, sweaty. It was so I like... I cannot even bring myself to watch it because I'm just like, oh, Jesus. I probably sound like, you know, I have... It, terrible vocal fry. I look so unhappy, <laughs> probably, but I'm I'm glad to know that uh, it, it's not a total disaster to people who aren't me. Uh, so thank no, you. it was fantastic. It was actually interesting because Craig and I were in a queer movie club over Zoom during quarantine, oh, and every every week, like somebody would pick a movie. So some of those movies that you featured, including Corel, I had <sighs> just seen. Which were, I mean, if if you're listening to this and you've never seen that, it's kind of a bonkers movie, but it's beautiful and weird and truly is Sexy. like a lot of fast vendors movies but yeah, yeah no it's definitely an odd movie wait i'm so curious if you don't mind me asking uh, what other movies did you watch uh, in that club we watched um god's own country mm -hmm. we watched, right i haven't seen but um bpm did you see mm -hmm. that i didn't but i heard a lot about it I, i'm yeah. so like slow on the uptake when it comes to like watching movies when they come out i feel like in <laughs> 10 years i'll finally watch bpm but i remember everyone was like it's the best thing ever so it was really moving i mean it was it's that's a great one we but we watched some older ones i'm trying to think like well we watched corel we watched some john waters i'm trying to remember which one nice. maybe i think polyester that was my pick um, that's a good one. yeah I, I love that one and I, actually i think polyester was one of the first times that I realized I was gay was because I was on a cruise ship with my parents. I was like 14 and I went back to the room because I wasn't like enjoying whatever we were doing. And so I put the TV on and polyester was on, but oh, I wow. didn't really understand like what I was watching. I was like, what is this? Like, what is yeah. happening? But I remember I loved it. I was like, this is amazing. I, I, whatever this is, I want to be part of this. <laughs> More of it, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I didn't come to John Waters until a college, but I love, uh, a lot of those movies also serial mom which is not oh, yeah. quite a movie i guess but anyway cool that, that's <laughs> i won't i won't bore listeners by asking you like what other movies did you watch in that club no no no. So. i actually looked it up before we spoke i was like he's gonna ask me what other movies we watched because I, <laughs> I knew i was gonna tell you that but anyway but you would be like an ideal dinner party guest for us because you could talk to craig about movies and talk to me about food totally yeah well i mean i i hope i could talk to you about food i have to be honest with you um I came into food writing by total accident and I feel like my baseline knowledge of food is just like sub-zero versus for film it's like I don't know. Uh, says a, higher, let's says say, a James so. Beard award winning uh, food writer. Give me a break. Just, That's just ridiculous. Food. Yeah, that's no, called I, false modesty. We're gonna diagnose that pretty early. No, no, no. I'm gonna you're gonna like see how much this kind of like like this conversation is going to bear that whole like a uh, statement of mine out, let's say <laughs> you'll be like, oh, damn, he really does not know anything about food. It's true. But whatever. We'll get to that. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, I mean, this is not a great commercial for I was going to bring up the fact that you have an upcoming cookbook yeah. <laughs> or not cookbook. Sorry. Um, book uh, yeah. called Taste Makers, And that's coming out in November. Yes, it is. Yes. Thank you for highlighting it. Yeah. So it is um, very much not a cookbook um, because uh you know, when I was going around selling it like three years ago, um, you know, I think some editors from more traditional publishers um, were like, oh yeah, we'd love like one. So let me preface this by saying <laughs> that a group biography of seven different immigrant women uh, who came to America and worked in food in some capacity, whether they were food writers, restaurant chefs, or both. Um, and yeah, so it's a group biography in that sense, but a lot of editors that I met with uh, in that stage three years ago were like, oh, so like, I would love a recipe at the end of each chapter, that kind oh, of yeah. thing. And the editor whom I um, ended up going with, uh, Melanie Tortorelli, Tortorelli at Norton, um, like first thing she said when we sat down, she's like, 
So I don't think recipes belong in this because I don't think you're that kind of writer. That's not your sensibility. I was like, thank goodness. I'm so glad there's not that kind of commercial pressure. But yeah, it's a it's very much a work of narrative nonfiction. Like uh, it is about people who cook, of course, but there are no recipes and that's just not my uh, skill set or expertise. So I'm more interested in like the humans and the human stories behind food rather than food as um, an object itself. So. Well, it's funny because I was rereading your Princess Pamela piece that won the James Beard Award before this. And you have such a clean journalistic style of writing. I mean, it, it almost feels egoless. Like it's not about you. It's about the stories that you're telling. And as yeah. you're talking about like your lack of culinary prowess, but your love for telling other people's stories, it's kind of reminding me of me because like my way into the food world was humor and comedy writing. <laughs> like right. I was like, I want to write, I want to write funny stuff. And oh, like, I'm also like interested in cooking and somehow like I, I wound up in this niche of like funny food writing, whatever that is. And it feels like, it feels like with you, it's like you're, it seems like your, your background is in journalism or that kind of writing. And then somehow you landed in the food world and brought that to it. Totally. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for saying that, uh, that, that kind of um, ego shedding is something that I aspire to, um, especially because so I started out food writing um, in 2016. Sorry, I'm already like getting into my life story. Please, <laughs> um, this is what this is all about. I'm doing this is, by the way, this first 10 minutes is just like chit chat. And then we're going to delve into your lunch and really yeah. pick you apart. So get ready totally. for that. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. I'll steal myself for that um, yeah. session. But yeah, um, so I, I started uh, my food writing career, quote unquote, in uh, 2016 when I was 24 years old. And um, prior to that, um, I had been a freelance writer, mostly writing about film and music and TV. I grew up wanting to be a film writer. Uh, I grew up reading like Pauline Kael and like her old stuff, obviously. She was not writing uh, actively when I was like uh, a kid or whatever, but I like consumed entertainment weekly, you know, mm -hmm. like um, there were film critics like David Thompson whom I devoured all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I really wanted to like pursue film, like criticism or film journalism and, uh, you know, to some extent, but obviously um, full-time jobs in that arena are um, few and far between. Right. Um, I, I know that you went to Tisch for um, grad school. I also almost went to Tisch for um, grad school as well for cinema studies. I almost actually went there for undergrad too, for dramatic writing, but- Oh, both, that's so funny. Yeah, both times I was like, nah, I'm gonna, uh, you know, choose a different path, you know, but um, that was very much like in the cards or whatever, but um, yeah. And then what happened was, Food 52, they were looking to hire a staff writer who's someone who wasn't necessarily like a food person, you know, someone who could write ably, I guess, about culture and, you know, maybe food occasionally. So like, mm -hmm. you know, um, culture through the lens of food, let's say. And I took the meeting and I was just kind of like, this is hilarious because I had never, ever considered writing about food. I think like the only thing I'd ever written about food prior to that point was a piece for the Village Voice that was like, stalled and then I'm pretty sure like my editor did not have like you know the heart to kill it but like I'm, <laughs> it was like you know gonna be killed basically you know so that was the extent of like my experience in the field and in general I just always felt as though you know I had this perception growing up that food writing was very classed and um very a very white field also in a way that would just be super exclusionary towards someone like me because uh, I didn't grow up in like a restaurant uh, eating family. And now I like went to like P.F. Chang's and like <laughs> Cheesecake Factory and stuff like that. So did I. Eating. That's actually where my family would always go. Chili's, Fridays, Cheesecake Factory, all those places. Yeah, yeah totally. that, was, that was luxury to us. Uh, where did yeah. you grow up again? I'm so sorry. Uh, Florida. I'm so sorry that I'm from Florida. But <laughs> I'm from New Jersey. It's the, it's okay. the north. So yeah. um, well, I started yeah. on Long on Long Island, and then we moved to Boca Raton, Florida. So it's all kind of of a piece. Oh wow, you're a Boca guy. That's amazing. Um, I guess yeah. I am. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so I, you know, growing up in New Jersey or whatever in the suburbs, like that was kind of our perception of luxury. So I was like, wow, being a food writer, that's funny. And I was not much of a cook then. I am maybe 1% more of a cook now. Um, so I was just like coming to food writing from um, a totally different kind of um, perspective and writing from a very different center of gravity than a lot of people I now call colleagues. Um, so yeah, it's interesting um, that I kind of found myself here and now it's been five years almost since that happened, um, which feels totally hilarious. But yeah, I've always tried to kind of just like 
keep that journalistic backbone as much as possible. But, you know, when I started food writing, this is sorry, this is why I started this spiel to begin with, excuse me. Um, <laughs> I um, was writing all like personal essays, you know, being like, what does food mean to me? You know, <laughs> I just, like, never thought about. It. And then I was in the staff writing job where I had to contemplate it all the time. And then within like three months, I was like, wow, I'm so bored by myself, like as a <laughs> subject, like everyone around me and everyone in history who I write about now, like, there's so much more interesting than little old me, you know, I just cannot see myself as a compelling character uh, in narrative terms. So I've like completely stopped, like, you know, pretending that uh, my job should be about myself in any regard. So anyway, thank you for saying that. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I, I share that with you because like when I had my food blog, I would write personal confessional essays and people would be like, wow, Adam, this is so moving. Thank you for sharing with us. But it got to the point where so many people were doing that. I was like, oh my God, I can't take another confessional food essay like it's enough like it's this, too much at all too much of a genre yeah. now exactly yeah. yeah and i don't know i mean and, and the same by that same token i guess you could say that some of the sorts of pieces i write now more of like you know like these uh, uh posthumous profiles or uh you know deep dives quote unquote um into uh figures who haven't been celebrated by the prevailing culture that's also become like this genre that is very crowded but it feels a little more justifiable than you know like this glut of personal essays yeah I, but what, what you're doing though like goes all the way back to the beginning of, i mean I, I, what's what's that famous biography that that guy wrote uh, i'm kind of uh, blanking you know what i'm talking about <laughs> like ben ben johnson ben johnson's like it's like the, like the first biography okay i don't even know what I i'm talking think about is ben johnson the guy who uh, like he won an oscar for the last picture show I don't <laughs> i've never seen the last picture show we're going off track okay now it's yeah, time totally right. film, yeah. film, film. <laughs> okay we're gonna ask you now because we've stalled long enough um are you, yeah. what did you have for lunch today oh, okay so this turned into a bit of production so um I was, let me answer your question first. I had frozen samosas that obviously heated up in the oven. Um, and the way that happened was, so that was not part of the plan. Initially, I, you know, I woke up, I was like, okay, I am going to wake up early-ish and you know, go get like a sandwich from my favorite sandwich place in the neighborhood. So I live in Williamsburg in Brooklyn um, and there's this place called Court Street Grocers, uh, which has locations throughout Brooklyn, including in Williamsburg. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna get like this one really good like turkey sandwich from there, you know, it's gonna be great. And then um, I was like, oh, but it's a bit of a schlep to pick it up. So I'll get it delivered, but then they weren't delivering. And I was like, oh, Jesus Christ, oh my goodness. So what do I do? And so then I was like, let me go to my second favorite sandwich place, which is this place called De Panur. They have this really good sandwich called <laughs> the Hangover Cure, which is, uh, like uh, eggs and avocado, sriracha, arugula, tomato, and some really good, I forget what kind of cheese it is, but it's on sourdough. It's really damn good. Um, but then the line was so long and I was just like, oh God, I can't wait. Uh, so I was just like, okay, I'm just gonna come home, find whatever is in my fridge and just like have some lunch. And so I was like, oh, there's samosas there. That's nice, yeah. And like an hour before that I had had like a, you know, a pretty substantial, like a protein, a smoothie uh, with a bunch of fruit and stuff like that. So I was like, okay, you know, I, I don't, if, if I eat too much, then I'm going to feel all sleepy. And then I have to be recording this whole thing with Adam. And I don't want to just like <laughs> fall asleep midway. You know? So wow, um, yeah, yeah, that's what I had. That's, that's, that's the whole, I made a federal case of it, you know? But, <laughs> well, actually, well, first I wanted to ask you, and then I'm going to bring up like what occurred to me while you were talking, but what, would you have had the samosas if you had if you weren't doing this podcast? Like, would you have eaten lunch at all? I would have, yes, totally. So um, it's interesting. Like last year is the year that you know, in lockdown or whatever, I became more serious about like actually eating all my meals and like eating well, quote unquote. And by eating well, I mean just like eating consistently and like putting an appropriate um, amount of food in my body because like during my whole book writing process, like the bulk of it in 2019, I developed this very, um, I guess, uh, unsustainable rhythm of, <laughs> I would just like, I, I drank so much that year. Now I'm sober. I've been sober for a year and a half, which is okay. yay. Congratulations. But, um, That's great. Thank you. Um, but I, um, you know, in 2019, I was just like drinking all the time. So I'd like wake up hang hungover, then like 
you know, power, like, you know, through my day, quote unquote, like with a cold brew. Um, and then I would just kind of like start drinking again at like 5 p.m. And then I would like try to have like, you know, a, a substantial dinner. And then I was like, okay, that's not really, you know, that's not really working for me. And it took me kind of sobering up and then going into lockdown and everything for me to realize that. So um, I spent um, actually quite a few months last year in lockdown um, with my mother in her apartment in Secaucus, New Jersey. So wow, okay. Um, yeah, which was actually really nice, you know? And like, I realized that of course it takes um, a degree of privilege to be able to say that, you know, I was able to um, get out of the city. I mean, she lives literally like 20 minutes outside the city in Secaucus, New Jersey. Um, <laughs> but uh, I was able to go there uh, at the beginning of lockdown because, you know, she's a senior citizen, she's a widow, she lives alone. and I was worried about her, you know, being able to get groceries and just do basic things. I knew she was going to be worried about me. And so I was like, okay, you know, I, I don't know when I'm going to see her next. I'm just going to make the executive decision to go. Um, and then also, you know, um, for my own peace of mind, I was like, you know, it might actually be nice to have an excuse to spend time with my mother. Um, especially because like, my dad had died uh, four years ago, and oh, like I'm I sorry. didn't get a sense. Uh, it's okay. Sorry to be all like, oh, I'm so sad. Um, no, it's but, okay to be um, sad. This is therapy. You're supposed that's to be sad. True, true, yeah. true to the title. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, and so after that, I was kind of like, you know, I didn't get to spend as much time with him as I wanted to. So it would be really nice to kind of spend that time with my mother. Um, so yeah, I ended up staying in Jersey with her in her apartment for quite a few months, and. During that time, you know, she loves to cook. She's a wonderful cook. Um, and I'm not just saying that in a way that's like, oh, you know, my mom's a great cook, like in her <laughs> romantic way, you know. Um, but as a result of just being there, I was like eating three meals a day consistently. I was like, damn, that's great. And so <laughs> when I came back to New York, I was like, okay, that is a pattern I'm going to hold. You know, I'm going to like um, stand firm by that. And I'm going to, you know, eat uh, more consistently. I'm not going to drink all that kind of stuff. So to answer your question, yes, I would have <laughs> had lunch. Um, but in terms of what I would have eaten, um, it either would have been those samosas or um, some sort of like <laughs> ham and cheese sandwich on like sourdough or something. That sounds like that. great. Well, it's yeah. funny. I had the opposite COVID journey that you had where I stuffed my face for a year uh, wow. and a half and just like literally, I cooked every day. I made like cakes and brownies. And like my husband right. was always like, I'm craving chocolate chip cookies. So I would just make chocolate chip cookies. And, <laughs> and so I went home to visit my parents who each had lost 60 pounds during quarantine by oh, doing wow. intermittent fasting. So oh now, now I'm like on the opposite journey that you're on. Like I'm starving right now. I haven't had breakfast and I'm like, <laughs> I'm, like I'm, I'm intermittent <laughs> fasting right now. And it's awful. <laughs> I'm, so I'm cranky yeah, that's and miserable. Right. That's such a Silicon Valley thing. I feel like intermittent fasting, right? Or maybe well, that's just it just means like, all I'm, the way I'm treating it is I'm just not having breakfast. Like that's really okay. all, all I'm doing. I usually have breakfast and I'm not mm -hmm. having breakfast right now. And so I'm cranky. Oh, I, I need food. I'm in a terrible mood, but I'm going to so persevere. Sorry. And I'm gonna, Yeah. You know, well, I, I, I don't detect any of the crankiness. Okay, like, you know, over yeah, this screen, so. It's all a mask. It's just like a smile hiding. Totally, right? But okay. With you. So when you were describing your lunch, the very first thing that occurred to me, which is going to make so much sense for who you are is your love for storytelling. I feel like, Throughout, throughout our conversation so far, there's just been a lot of storytelling. And I feel like that makes sense for what you do, for your career, but also it feels like such an integral, I mean, I've only known you for 20 minutes, but it already feels like an <laughs> integral part of your personality. And I was curious if you could talk a little bit about your relationship to storytelling and were you always a storyteller and to come from a family of storytellers? Yeah, wow, that is a very uh, keen observation and a kind one. Um, uh, yeah, I, I do come from a family of storytellers. So um, I started to kind of get into this a few minutes ago, but um, my, so in addition to me, like almost going to Tisch at NYU twice, um, which is funny because I now teach at NYU, but not at Tisch. Yeah, so I want to hear cool. all about that. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, so in addition to that, um, my sister, who's nine years older than me, she went to Tisch uh, for acting, for drama. Um, and that was kind of encouraged by my late father who, um, you know, by day, he, so my father, he was from uh, the Indian state of West Bengal, just like my mother, they had an arranged marriage, but um, my dad was very like 
artistically inclined and he was very much a cinephile. Um, so when he came to America, you know, by day he like, you know, did IT stuff, but by night he kind of indulged his artistic whims. So um, he, you know, wrote plays in his, uh, in, in his like spare time that he then, um, you know, had people perform at like the Fringe Festival um, in New York. And he wow. like, started his own like, um, um, South Asian independent like film festival in Jersey that ran for a few years. You know, he just like put a lot of time and energy into these kinds of things, you know, but in addition to that, you know, he just like raised me on movies and, you know, movies were the first form of storytelling that I was really like, you know, um, that really resonated with me. So um, all of that was just kind of around me and I guess I absorbed it, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as much as I could growing up, um, especially because like so much of um, our spare time as a family was spent like, you know, helping dad out doing, you know, like some, you know, theater related thing or watching my sister in a play in the city, that kind of stuff, you know. Um, what did your dad do professionally? He, well, he had trouble, uh, you know, bless his soul, um, <laughs> he had trouble holding down a job. Um, I'll just be honest about that, but he, um, I guess the easiest way to put it is that he was um, an engineer um, and like worked in IT type stuff. You know, I don't, I see, I, I have so little like literacy when it comes to just like anything that's like STEM related that mm -hmm. I'm like, uh, IT engineering, like what, <laughs> is there a difference? I don't even know. Um, okay. but, like, you know, um, it's something that, um, you know, he, he worked at a few different companies uh, doing that kind of stuff, but that was so clearly not his passion mm -hmm. to the point where like, um, you know, sometimes during work, he would literally just be like working on his like film festival stuff and that kind of thing. And so I think like seeing that made me realize like, damn, you know, I really don't want that kind of life where, you know, my, there is that kind of neat and, um, or not neat, very frustrating kind of bifurcation between like, what I do to make a living and what I actually care about or whatever. There must be a way to fuse those two things, you know? So, well, I mean, how sweet that you get to sort of fulfill his dreams in a way. You're, yeah, you're, you're living totally. a creative life that, that he probably wanted. Exactly. Yeah. And it is very um, odd, I will say. Uh, sorry, we're really leaning to the like whole therapy thing here. So forgive me. But um, it's odd that like so much has happened in my life professionally ever since his death. Um, you know, like that James Beard Award you mentioned happened after he died. And that's, I think, why it felt like such a big deal in my head. You know, it was just kind of like, damn, I went through the worst thing in my life. And now like this huge kind of validation has come. Um, and I think awards are, in general are very just like screwed up. I'll just be as diplomatic as possible there. Um, <laughs> you know, that whole thing felt very nice. And I wish that he had been able to see that. And I wish he had been able to see the fact that I sold a book and wrote it and that I'm about to, you know, like uh, come out with it. But yeah, you know, whenever I get frustrated about um, being in this particular industry, like food media specifically, you know, I think about the fact that like, I'm really grateful, you know, I'm sorry to be all corny about this, but no, I'm not at all. really grateful to like, you know, be able to make a living uh, writing, you know, uh, in a way that my father could not. And like, he really did have to make sacrifices for that to happen for me. So I'm, I'm grateful, truly. Well, my mother's father, I mean, I have that in my family too, where he secretly was a writer, but he, um, you know, he just worked menial, not menial jobs, but like he sold advertising for newspapers and just like scra scraped by to like make a living for his family. But my mom showed me once like a suitcase that was just filled with his writing and he wrote like a script for the honeymooners that like was a oh, simple script and things like wow. that and so it's like that feeling of like wow like you know when I got to write for tv it was like okay like I'm fulfilling this dream of my grandfather who I didn't even know but it's like I'm carrying on this legacy of that's super cool yeah yeah no I had that kind of moment um first of all that's so cool um I had that kind of moment where um after my dad died, you know, there was kind of like big Google Drive or whatever of all his unfinished writing. And like one was about this one Bengali actor uh, named Uthi Kumar and this like Satyajit Ray movie that he was in or whatever. And my mom was always like, you should finish it one day, et cetera. Um, but then we like lost the password to the oh, no. <laughs> 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 Didn't happen. But then uh -huh. I ended up writing about that very performance for 
the Criterion Collection um, last year. And, you know, for my mom, of course, to observe that, it just felt very special to her and it felt special to me too. It's like, oh damn, you know, like I'm making that come together. But yeah, I mean, you know, maybe one day I will get the password, dust off his stuff and, you know, complete his unfinished writings and, you know, uh, with his name on them, you know, that'll be nice too. Have so. you ever written uh, like a screenplay or like, have you, have you delved into that? I haven't really, no. Um, so, I said earlier that I uh, almost went to uh, Tish. Sorry, why is this coming up so much? <laughs> no, this is like it's Tish therapy, not lunch therapy. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> um, no, so when um, I was in my senior year of high school applying to colleges, um, you know, I just decided on a whim to, dis- uh, to uh, apply to the dramatic writing program at Tish. But to do that, um, so I'd like gone to creative writing, like, you know, summer camps before and everything like that, but it was all for fiction, um, not for like screenwriting or anything like that. And so what I did literally as I was preparing that application was I, <laughs> I looked up like how to write a script or like, uh-huh. you know, literally like a template. And then I was like, it was like a straight up like copy paste job between like, you know, my <laughs> little, like short stories or whatever and like that template. Um, and so that is like the closest that I've come to any sort of screenwriting, um, which is uh, hilarious. And, you know, I, I don't want to like uh, turn the tables or whatever too much, but I mean, I'm so curious to know like what your um, experience was with screenwriting before, you know, it became your job. <laughs> well, I, um, it was a similar situation where I w- needed to write a play to get into Tish. Um, mm-hmm. I was in law school. I, I basically had right. gone to law school to please my parents after coming out because they were so disappointed in the fact that I was gay. So I was like, okay, okay. I'll go to law school. They'll, they'll like that. And then I went there and, and I hated it. And I right. knew that I wanted to be a writer, but I studied playwriting in college. And I'd, mm-hmm. I'd, I'd won an award. Speaking of awards being stupid, but I, I won an award <laughs> in college for um, best play, which actually was like, okay, maybe that's a little sign that like I can do this. I was just like in the back of my head. So in my third year of law school, I just wrote a play and it was about a Jewish summer camp where all like the mother figures were also the camp counselors, but it sort of became gradually like, turned into like a concentration camp. And it was like this like weird, like Criti- you know, critique of Jewish culture, I guess, that kind of used all these themes. It was really dark, but it was called Tragedy at Camp Zebulon. And uh-huh. I literally submitted it to three places. I submitted it to the Yale School of Drama, to mm-hmm. NYU Tisch Grad School, and Juilliard. And mm-hmm. I told my parents what I was doing, and they're like, you are crazy. Like, you're insane. Like, what do you think you're doing? Like, you're a lawyer. Like, you have to be a lawyer. Uh, and then I got rejected from Yale and I was like, okay, like, that's it. Like, I guess I'm going to be a lawyer. And then I got an interview at Juilliard, which my parents, they couldn't believe it. Like I, cause they always had like thought Juilliard was the, you know, the totally. of, and so I told my dad, I was like, I got this interview at Juilliard and he came with me. He flew with me to New York and we went to that. And I didn't get that, but then I got into NYU. So it was kind of this incredible experience of validation from the universe that, okay, like maybe there was this part of me that could do this, but. Totally. And but look it, at where it's landed to you, you know? I guess. I mean, it's a rough industry. It's not like the greatest as, as the same, when you were talking about food media, it's like, well, it's not much better in film right. and television, but. Um, no, absolutely not. Yeah, no, I mean, I saw that firsthand with my uh, sister, you know, I mean, it, for her, it was not easy as like, you know, a, uh, to my mind, very beautiful, very talented, but still like, you know, brown woman who's also short. We're all short in the family. Um, you okay. know, and she's um, an it actress. Really odd. Yeah, yeah, as an actress. Yeah, so she, um, yeah, she's no longer acting and oh, like, okay. completely understandable, but you know, like, it's a really ruthless industry and my sense is that you really gotta love uh, you know the work but even that you know is probably not enough to steal uh, yourself for all the indignities that come your way I oh know. yeah I mean I'm tiptoeing back into food writing now I've been doing more food stuff and I just sold the totally. cookbook but like the yeah. way the, the way the food world used to like beat me up and like make me miserable now I come back to it and I'm like oh my god like beat me up food world like this is nothing totally, <laughs> this right? is easy yeah right so. yeah you know I I have a feeling that I I might be like that too you know some whenever I'm like oh god like I can't stand this like industry and how racist and screwed up it is blah yeah. blah blah I have a feeling that I'm going to like miss, you know, just like, I don't want to say lo- how low stakes it feels sometimes, but you know, it, it can, it, it just, it's a different kind of um, environment than a lot of other creative fields, let's say. That's my sense. So yeah. That All right. Well, <laughs> you've turned the tables long enough. We have to go back to your therapy. So I'm Fine. actually curious, this is a strange question, but I feel like you'd be the right one to ask it because, okay, I'm thinking about your storytelling. And mm-hmm. now I'm thinking about the story of your lunch and like, what would you think of a character in a movie 
who did exactly what you did in the story, like what would that reveal about the character, which was that like you went to the first place uh, uh-huh. to get the turkey sandwich, but what, what was the thing? The line was too long or what was the reason? Yeah, the line was too long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you went to the second place. Well, no, the second place's line was too long. First place did not deliver and it was too big, of, uh, too too long of a walk, you know, for me. Oh, to yeah, so, okay, too long of a walk. So you see this character in a movie and he's uh-huh. like, okay, that's too far of a walk. And then he gets to the other place and he's like, this line's too long. And then he goes out home and he like heats up some frozen Samoas. Like if right. that were all like in a silent movie, like what would you think that you learned about this character? Um, well, that this person is just like incredibly anxious, maybe does not have like a firm center, you know, like uh, obviously like, you know, I'm a man, but like I, I would imagine this is not a silent era actress but like I would imagine like a Diane Keaton uh, (laughs) like you know playing this sort of role really well just like super just like nervy and agitated and just kind of like their mind is like racing you know a million miles a minute or whatever and just they're unable to kind of like let themselves relax um and I I feel like there is a significant part of me that is still like that you know I think that um ever since I like stopped drinking or whatever, like a lot of that has vanished and just like, okay, whatever, it's going to work out. It'll be fine. So I wasn't like freaking out running around my neighborhood or anything like that, mm-hmm. um, you know, right before this, but um, there is still that kind of anxiety that guides a lot of how I move through the world, you know? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the anxiety would be the main reveal there, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and um, I guess the, uh, yeah, no, that, that that's my conclusion. I'm trying to think of what other character traits kind of. Um, well, the you know, food of it all, I mean, like to bring it to, to food again, like I think it's also like that the food part of it mattered to you. Like you were you were seeking out things that you knew to be delicious. Like that, that, that it wasn't insignificant what you were trying to do, but Absolutely. it just, you didn't have enough time for it, but you were driven by food. You were driven by absolutely. something good. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. I knew the end game was to feed myself well. Um, and, you know, in a way that was truly satisfying. Also because I knew I want to have something to talk about, but then I was just like, wanted my body to feel okay, you know? <laughs> so uh, yeah, it was kind of, it was definitely a combination of those two things. I will say this too, um, and maybe this will spark some uh, questions for you, but um, you know, like going back home last year, I did get to eat a lot more, um, you know, like, so New Jersey has just like so many Indian Indian grocery stores that uh, at least my uh, part of Brooklyn does not necessarily, you know, it takes like a few trains to Queens and that kind of stuff, which I'm not opposed to, but it's not like, you know, something I do like, uh, you know, every week or anything like that. Right. Um, and so as a result, you know, I, I do kind of miss like whatever tastes um, that, you um, availability in Jersey gives me access to, you know? And so like, I feel like frozen samosas, like, you know, they're, they are what I would call comfort food, I guess, you know, I know the term is so overused and kind of worn and cliched, but I really do think it holds true in this case, you know? Um, and Can you walk I, me I, through like the, the samosas, like what was in them? Like how do you yeah, eat them up? Yeah. So these were uh, deep brands, um, which actually I think like places like Fresh Direct also sell. Um, so like they're, they've kind of, uh, you know, crept into the mainstream, let's say, um, but uh, they are, they're pretty big. They're not like those, you know, I, like Whole Foods, for example, uh, for example, um, sells like really small little triangles and stuff like that. They're, they're like pretty substantial, these ones. Um, they're big, four common a pack. I'm really getting descriptive here. Yeah, I love um, it. That's great. And, and uh, they come with the, these like packs of like, um, you know, this like minty, like chutney sauce. Um, and uh, yeah, so I just put two on like um, a baking sheet or whatever. Um, and uh, I, yeah, they were in the oven for like 20 minutes, I want to say, you know, initially. So I like, I turned them over like halfway or whatever. Okay. Um, but when I took them out of the oven, finally, the, the centers were cold. And oh, as no. I was eating them, I was like, oh no, this sucks. And you know, I'm running out of time here. <laughs> you know, I got this you know, recording and everything like that. You know? I just like quickly like push them back in the oven. Um, but I and- wasn't going to know. I mean, I mean, was, was it more about like reporting on your lunch or was it for your own pleasure? No, for my own pleasure, definitely. Okay. You know, and I also like, I know these are just, so sorry, I, I didn't answer your question. They're filled with potatoes and peas. And you know, it's just oh, yeah. like, your typical like spice potatoes piece that kind of thing um but um 
<laughs> for some reason I always have speaking of anxiety I always have this anxiety about like uh giving myself food poisoning accidentally you know <laughs> okay. and so whenever something's like not heated through properly or whatever I'm like oh my god I'm going to die tonight or like I'm just gonna be like you know just be unable to sleep because you know like I have food poisoning or something like that so I'm like quickly get it gotta get it back in the oven otherwise I'm just gonna like this uh worry is going to be poisoning my brain all day and I don't I feel like I've met my match in terms of anxiety I mean I'm a very anxious person but I had no idea it's so funny because your public persona like your pictures of you and like even on the criterion thing like you seem so confident and so just like you know, not not anxious and whatever the opposite of anxious is and so it's yeah. so funny to like talk to you and be like oh like you're just like me you're totally oh anxious. yeah totally yeah. I'm so glad that we're kindred spirits here yeah and I I, I guess I'm doing something right in uh, you know projecting <laughs> this uh public image that is so different from how I am yeah, like, yeah. well you kind of like smol- smoldering your images it's like I could like imagine you like on a horse or something or like totally. yeah, you know yeah. like hold, holding a gun yeah right no. in reality i'm just like five four like anxious guy you know? <laughs> which is wow. like you know, totally fine but you know all my group chats uh see all that stuff every day you know uh Got i try it. not to let this uh you know um seep in the public eye too much so well, you're about to be exposed in a very major way with all the eight listeners that listen to this podcast gonna find- <laughs> <Please. laughs> i've heard like 10 people no, yeah kidding. 10 people um okay so now i want to get into the food of it all in terms of so we get i, I have a good sense of like the the journey or the like the mm-hmm. way your life sort of played out in terms of like new jersey right. kind of growing up cheesecake factory and then Four, four years ago or five years ago, you got this job at Food 52 right, five and, then, years and you kind of chose food as a subject. And then one, you know, and now like I looked at your website, like you've written so much, you've done so much about food now. Um, but like, when did it click over? Like, when did you start taking food seriously as something that was important to you in terms of like what you ate? Because it seems like for your lunch today, like you were thinking a lot about what you ate. So when did that happen? Yeah. Oh, that's a very good question. Um, you know. I think that I don't want to repeat myself too much, but I really do feel as though being back home last year did make me take food seriously. Of course, I was writing about food professionally prior to that point. And, you know, I had reasons to take food seriously from like a professional angle, but I didn't really put too much stock in just like how I fed myself, you know? Um, And I think it's because like, you know, early on in my food writing career, like, um, it was just such a, it was just such a crazy time in my life, you know, where there was so much that was changing, like, you know, my dad had died, you know, then the whole word thing happened, whatever, all that stuff. Um, I went freelance, um, and sold a book and everything like that. And so I think that everything that was happening in my life kind of primed me to see food as just like, something that was purely professional and, you know, a way to kind of um, extract like social capital, which is so like gross to like think (laughs) about now, because like, I think that, you know, being in lockdown last year really helped me understand that like, one thing that I really do not like about this industry is that people take like, you know, this idea of like, oh, I went to X restaurant as, you know, a way to kind of, you know, assert that they're like, you know, they're like cool or whatever erudite in some way in the same way that someone might do with like you know oh I saw this movie you know by like Pasolini or whatever that kind of thing <laughs> you know and it's like I don't know I, I just don't like that because I think that um re- so many restaurants are just like so exclusionary by design especially from a class perspective you know I'm not Scrooge McDuck over here you know <laughs> and like I, I don't have that much money to spend um and so um yeah so anyway all that is to say that last year is when, you know, when I was finally with my mother again, I like returned to my roots, quote unquote. I was just like, okay, you know, like I actually, it's, it feels great to just be like, you know, feeding myself and eating consistently, especially with someone I love so much. And, you know, my mother is my best friend. Sorry to be all corny about this and shit, but like, you know, it's true. Um, It's like, yeah. And like, you know, just to have food in that kind of loving context kind of reminded me that, you know, what um, role food does play in my life beyond just kind of providing me mere sustenance, you know? And so, by the way, this feels like your screenplay you're going to write about like the food writer who doesn't really love food, who then goes to stay with his mother during the pandemic and then 
she totally. opens him up to this whole new oh, world. Absolutely. This is going to be like my heartburn or something like yeah, that. Yeah, gotta write it. Yeah, mom. yeah. So totally. what, were, what were the dishes that your mom was making for you when you were home? Like what? Yeah, you know, three meals um, a day. Totally. Um, well, we did alternate sometimes. So I did the very like uh, you know she did the heavy lifting. I did the light stuff. You know, like um, like we made smoothies every morning. Whatever that was usually our breakfast or like you know some sort of like granola oatmeal type situation um and then for lunch we made each other sandwiches pizzas all that stuff um but for dinner she did a lot of bengali cooking um so um that kind of stuff is usually just like you know rice dal which is like you know a, in our household or whatever it was like this yellow puddle of lentils and then there's like some sort of vegetable dish you know it could be like okra or cauliflower or something else uh, you know in some sort of kind of spice mix let's say um and then a protein and we always had like you know either chicken or shrimp lamb goat all that stuff you know um stuff that i would be like uh too scared to cook on my own you know mm -hmm. i again as i said earlier you know i do have this kind of um real fear of like handling like you know raw meat or whatever and um wow. and, like giving myself like food poisoning uh yeah that's the thing that I said earlier and so like like the other day for example I had to like um make this like pork uh like soup or whatever and <laughs> after I like was done cutting the pork and like you know I put it in the soup and everything like that I was just like oh my god like did I actually did I like touch a surface and then like touch something like on my face that will like make me get food poisoning like what's going to happen you know there so, hasn't been a case of trichinosis in the United States since the early 30s so you're well, fine with pork yeah. pork is fine yeah, well, I, I I wish I had known that before I, you know, like uh, took on this little project of yeah. mine uh, last Sunday. But um, yeah, and so um, you know, she um did a lot of that kind of stuff, just like uh, heavy like curries slash stews. Um, so yeah, that was kind of like a typical night. Um, you know, in the uh, Sen apartment, let's say. Um, so yeah, it was nice, you know. And then like you know, there were some special occasion foods. Like one was um. This thing called um luchi which is like this um <laughs> it's like susan luchi um it's <laughs> um this um like deep fried like a uh, flatbread um that is very popular in bengali cuisine and it's usually served with um you know like aloo like potatoes or whatever um that are like spiced really delicately so uh that kind of thing you're um, making me so hungry right now i'm like inter I'm intermittent hungry. fasting is going to end like a second we hang up <laughs> right yeah, yeah, yeah totally no i mean i yeah i love my mom's cooking so much and i and i miss just like you know having constant access to that and you know that's kind of a classic story of like oh i left home and i miss mm -hmm. my mother's cooking that kind right. of thing so like then i go in the frozen aisle and find a samosa you know that sort of like <laughs> thing um yeah. I, I don't want to indulge that narrative too much but um I, I i do feel as though subconsciously that's probably what guided me to you know get this in the grocery store in the first place so well, I'm curious, like, because you talked about the Cheesecake Factory and those kinds of restaurants growing up, but was your mom also cooking when you were growing up? Like, was this always there for you? Yeah, yeah, she was definitely. She was the cook in our family. Um, and um, it was, of course, a very gendered thing in the sense that, you know, my father, like, he very rarely cooked. He had, like, one dish that he excelled in, which was, like, an egg curry uh, called mm -hmm. Dima Damna, um, which is literally, like, you know, curry of egg basically um but um well that's not quite the literal translation but whatever um yeah but otherwise she was the one who was doing all the cooking you know and so she became just like quite accustomed to that kind of thing so it just like carried over and um yeah I don't know I would offer to help a lot you know um while I was back home last year and she was just like no 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 please like she really I think that she derived a lot of genuine joy from like being able to feed someone else you know mm -hmm. um I think part of it is the fact that you know I am her son she loves me so much and also because like there has been this absence in her immediate living space of my father uh for what by that point had been three years you know so I think that it actually was really nice for her to feed herself uh, and feed someone else again you know um I won't I won't delve too much into my mother's relationship with food but I will say that you know before I came back to Jersey to be with her for a bit, you know, she was also like, you know, what I described as my relationship to food in 2019 was like her relationship to food as well. Like mm -hmm. she was having like 
cereal for dinner and all that kind of stuff you know oh, she was fascinating like, yeah you know um wait i, I want to watch this movie this movie's gonna be so good you have to write this yeah totally it's gonna be like split screen of us just having our like you know pathetic little dinners and then like you know being reunited and then like, yes and then the last scene is you heating up samosas for lunch and then doing this interview exactly right yeah yeah and then <laughs> heading to you know zoom and <laughs> <laughs> yeah like, wait i interrupted yeah. you you're about to say something maybe you don't remember now what you're about to oh, say shit. no i do not remember i'm so sorry also, excuse my language. I hope it's okay for me to say shit. That's fine. This is, again, eight people are listening to this. So <laughs> as long as they're okay. So I was going to ask you, I mean, you talk, I feel like some of the political lens that you use in your writing has crept up a bit in this conversation about how it, how it's the gendered cooking at home or just things mm -hmm. like that. And I'm curious, like, when did that awareness about food or even just talking about access and restaurants and uh, mm -hmm. status like has that always been there for you like that awareness or was that something that as you got older you started to be, think more about um I definitely started to think more about it within the context of food when I became older and when I started doing this stuff professionally I was like oh yeah you know like why is it that I was not primed to take food seriously quote unquote or mm -hmm. like ever consider uh food writing within the realm of possibility oh, it's because of this class angle and the fact that, you know, I, uh, th those spaces always seemed so white in a way that I just was not and could not kind of assimilate myself into well enough, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, that awareness did not live inside me until after I began writing about this. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's weird. I think within like the first few years of me being a food writer, I really tried my best to kind of, you know, parrots like, the party line within the industry and just be like yeah my life is going out to restaurants that kind of thing and <laughs> i was like oh i hate this this is not me you know and this is like i feel like i'm cosplaying this sort of a persona that is just so far from who i am you know um and i think part of that like part of the fact that i uh you know fucked under that pressure had to do with the fact that i felt as though I needed to be a public person, you know, um, especially after getting um, institutional validation from the industry. I was kind of mm -hmm. like, okay, I've been like, you know, I've been welcomed into the, like the food club or whatever. And now, now I need to like start dressing up like a food person and conducting myself in that mm -hmm. manner instead of in a way that was authentic to myself. So um, it's nice to kind of, you know, snap out of it and be like, no, 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 I, I, I'm not that kind of person. I don't want to be. Um, but you know, I think that that awareness about food itself would not have um, arrived to me had I not just had that kind of basic understanding of the world beyond food uh, before mm -hmm. that. So, you know, my dad, in addition to being like, you know, this very artistically inclined person, he uh, was a very, I guess you could see he was a far leftist um, back mm -hmm. in West Bengal. He was like, you know, a student activist. He was what we call the Noxialites. Um, in um, West Bengal, and it was very um, politically dangerous work, let's say. Um, but he raised me with that, those kinds of progressive ideals, you know, um, mm -hmm. in a way of looking at and understanding the world. And so um, I think that I have always tried to keep whatever sense of justice he instilled within me, uh, you know, within myself also, like I just and in terms of the way that I look at the world, you know, mm -hmm. so when I got to the food world or whatever, I was like, oh, okay, you know, this, this is all kind of locking into place, you know, the way that I understood the world is like, this is a microcosm of all that stuff, so. Well, it's funny because I'm coming to New York, by the way, uh, Craig is leaving on Monday and he's staying in Williamsburg. He's working on a secret project. Oh okay, I'll tell you, I'm not supposed to say what it is, but I'll just tell you it's Gossip Girl. He's directing an episode. Holy um, shit, that's amazing. Oh my yeah. God, so many opinions flying around about that show. And <laughs> I, I know. Yeah, but he's going to be there. He'll be in Williamsburg. So I'm coming at the end of July. So maybe I can meet you in real life. Yes, but, please. I love that. But I'm bringing this up because I like tweeted yesterday or I Instagrammed like, where should I eat in New York? And, right. and I got like this huge list of restaurants. And obviously everyone was like, you have to go to Via Caruta. You have to go to Via Caruta in the West Village, right. which I've been to and I really like. But it's mm -hmm. so funny. Like when I went to make a reservation, it said like, you can't make a reservation, but Platinum Club member, like a Platinum Amex, like card owners can get like a table. And it's just like, I felt like that same feeling you're talking about. of just like, this is kind of gross. Like how great oh, can that salad be that like, I have to like get a Platinum card to eat it, you know? Totally. No, yeah, I still have not been there. and. A friend even suggested the other day who was visiting from out of town, like, oh, let's go there. I missed their pasta or something. I was like, I don't know. This is giving me palpitations. Like, let's go <laughs> somewhere else. It was like going to be on a Saturday night, too. So it's just like, and the other thing, too, about dining out in New York is that it 
feels like such a scene, you know? I think that one of my main frustrations with being within food media is that it just, it feels like high school again. Mm -hmm. And I won't deny that, you know, um, earlier in my career, I played into those dynamics too, you know? Um, because I had a lot of opinions all the time and I had this <laughs> kind of desire to broadcast them to the world over Twitter. And that's like something I just like don't do anymore. Um, but I just do that in my group chats now, but <laughs> um, not for public consumption. But, um, you know, it's weird how living in New York and being in this industry, it comes with this added layer of anxiety of like, oh my God, am I going to see someone? Like who's mm -hmm. going to see me at that restaurant? That's oh yeah. Like, and that's such an exhausting way to live, you know? It's mm -hmm. like that. And I just, I don't know if like LA feels the same way, but like, you know, certainly. No, yeah. I mean, when I left New York, I actually really missed that culture. I remember like right before I left, I had dinner at Hearth in uh, the East Village. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I love Marco Canora, the chef. He's like a, a real sweetheart and he's done this podcast. But I remember like one night I ran into Kat Kinsman and the late Josh Ozerski and oh, like wow. a couple of other people. And it was and LA at the time when I moved here, there was only one figure that like was the one that you'd want to like run into or see, which was who was Jonathan Gold. Right. And, like I would sometimes I saw him at the butcher shop. I was like, oh my God, that's Jonathan Gold. But after he passed away, I honestly cannot say the name of like a person that's in the LA food media that I would feel like, oh, like that's a member of the community. I mean, Ben Mims is here and we're friends and a couple right. of people, but New York was so different because you had publishing, you had magazines, you had the Food Network, you just had like so much so, is there. Much. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I just need to rid myself of any kind of anxiety. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm on Lexapro <laughs> now. It's great. Just like put some right. Lexapro in your smoothies. You'll do fine. Well, oh. okay. So, yeah, we're nearing the end. So I want to make sure I ask you before we end, like, tell me a little bit about teaching food writing at NYU. Yeah, so I have been teaching food journalism at NYU since 2019. Um, and, you know, I thought it was kind of hilarious that I was even asked in the first place because, you know, I'm 29 now, but I feel like I'm 12 oh years old. And You're so, so young. How, how have well, you accomplished so much at 29? I need therapy after this. My God. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's very sweet, but um, I just got very lucky. But um, I you know, at that point I was 27 and I was just like, wow, I feel like I just finished undergrad like two seconds ago. So this is like kind of hilarious. And of course, like I had those experiences where I was like in the faculty lounge or whatever. And everyone was like, um, should you be a student? Like what, what's going on here? You know, I was like, whatever, but it's fine. Um, I can deal with that kind of stuff. But yeah, so um, I teach during the summers, I teach um, a class that is called Eating America, and it's a mix of undergrads and grads and the, um, you know, occasional very gifted uh, high school senior. Um, and then spring and fall, I teach advanced reporting food writing, which is for um, a few juniors, but mostly uh, graduating seniors in the journalism school. Um, so it is fascinating to teach uh, food journalism, given the fact that I... Um, I entered this industry not identifying as a food person, and I mm -hmm. don't know that I quite do still, you know, um, like identify as a food person, but I think that actually is a real asset, you know, because I'm able to be like, <laughs> okay, here's how to approach, you know, like this kind of storytelling if it is green territory for you, mm -hmm. uh, because it, you know, my um, entry into this world was just, it, it still feels quite recent, you know, and very few of the students I encounter in any of the semesters I teach are people who are like, I want to do this my whole life, yeah. you know, like, I want to do this forever, you know, that kind of thing. You know, I think there are very few food writers, though, who were born like, I'm going to be a food writer. I do think most people I've met who are food writers sort of stumbled into it. Like, even Jonathan Gold was like a rock journalist, like, and, right. uh, you know, I just like everyone starts somewhere else and then somehow winds up here. Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, there's a small O'Neill piece where she calls them like the plan B food writers and actually like Julia Child is uh you know included in that like plan uh -huh. B food writer prop but anyway um so um yeah I mean I will say this I really like teaching is so exhausting of course um I grading takes a lot of time and energy out of me but I also want to make sure that um my students are getting you know the attention that their writing deserves and that's why I really take this as seriously as possible Great. um so um, it is a lot of work, but it's really worth it because um, I think that during my first few years in food media, I, 
I felt this pressure to just kind of be public, broadcast my opinions all the time, whatever, that kind of thing. And teaching has really forced me to step back and become a bit more private and just kind of mm-hmm. like focus on this more interpersonal work, you know? And that is truly fulfilling, you know? I'm sorry to sound like, you know, uh, Hilary Swank in that one movie, whatever it's called. Like, uh, yeah, Which that, movie? That, the, the one where she's a teacher, you know? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. And my friend, just, yeah, my like, friend Henry is a teacher here in LA and we were like, bringing up all those movies like Dangerous Minds and all those things right, where exactly. everybody comes and saves like, the souls of their students. But I'm curious, as a, as a food writing teacher, what is the number one thing that like puts you on edge when you see it in somebody's food writing? Is there like a word or uh, like a thing that like, keeps occurring where you're like, oh, if I see that one more time, I'm going to kill somebody? That is a great question. I mean, of course, it's like some variation of uh, tastier, delicious, um, uh-huh. of course, kind of just like nails on chalkboard, but that's something that, you know, um, I have to teach around or whatever. I have to be like, okay, you know, I understand the impulse here. Um, I think more troubling is the use of the word ethnic or exotic, you know, mm-hmm. because I think that those are truly just like, um, words that do center a white reader more often than not. And, um, mm-hmm. I, I really do try to, I'm sorry to sound like I'm on Tumblr or something, but like <laughs> I, I do try to like, you know, teach my uh, students to kind of decolonize their food writing as yeah. much as possible, or at least, you know, uh, not presume a um, certain kind of reader who is, you know, like white and affluent, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And I think that has to do a lot with the fact that, um, you know, I did get my start writing at Food 52, which, you know, this is not breaking news and I'm not slandering the company in any way by saying this. It does... It, it has for a very long time catered to that kind of audience member. You know, the mm-hmm. reader who is the presumed reader of a site like 252 is usually a white affluent uh, woman, you know, and writing around those sensitivities um, is something that I had to learn how to do in mm-hmm. order to just like, you know, make a living and make sure that that job was not total hell for me, you know? And so mm-hmm. I've spent the past few years, and especially through writing this book, making sure that I'm not playing into those tropes too much, you know, because I'm not, um, you know, working for that kind of institution anymore. Um, And so I want to make sure that my students know that that's not the only way to kind of succeed within this industry is to kind of just like, you know, be like, okay, this is a game, got to play by these rules, you know, Mm -hmm. like there's, there should be a little uh, room to kind of push back as much as possible. So um, yeah, that's the kind of confidence that I want my students to have. But yeah, I mean, I, I love it. It's great. I mean, so much work truly so much work yeah. and I'm in between semesters right now you know so I'm starting up again in two weeks and I'm just like okay I gotta strap in you know but it's it's worth it so. they probably love having you as a teacher though having like a young cool uh, food writing so. teacher who's like still at the you know at the beginning of your career I mean like you have so much more that you're gonna do so let's go watch and see I get like hit by a car tonight or something oh like stop that. don't say that oh. Or, yeah, I'm sorry. In Yiddish, that's <laughs> a Hanahara. It's called a Hanahara you're going to bring up on yourself. So don't do that. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. <so>, that out. <laughs> yeah. What, what are you drinking? Is that black coffee? Yeah, it's a cold brew. Happy yeah. Pride Month. I'm gay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Well, we're nearing the end. So every podcast begins with what did you have for lunch? But it ends with what will you be having for dinner tonight? Uh-huh. So here's here's another a story. Uh, final story for you. <laughs> yeah, let's hear it. Um, parting gift is, um, so I was supposed to get dinner with a friend of mine uh, who's visiting from out of town. Then she texts me this morning being like, I got sick last night from something I ate. Uh, you know, what do we do? And we had a reservation for this Vietnamese place called Ban Da, which um, I hope I'm not mispronouncing it. Um, it seemed really wonderful. Um, it's over in Manhattan. And so I was like, okay, we should definitely rain check with that, like, you know, that hang or whatever. But then I was like, should I just like invite someone else to the reservation or should I just cancel it? And then I looked at my bank account. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I, let's, let's call this one off and I'll just, you know, cook whatever is in my fridge tonight. So um, that restaurant meal is not happening. Uh, but now I have to figure out what I'm actually making for dinner. I have a bunch of kale that is probably about to like, go a little bad <laughs> I mean like you know a few days so I, I might have to figure out kind of what to do with all that that isn't just like you know a whole thing of kale chips or whatever so if you've got any recommendations <laughs> for kale like yeah. kale and white beans I used to make like a kale and white bean like stew with like sausage in it 
That is smart. You know, I haven't like gotten on the bean train yet. I know oh, I'm yeah. literally the only person in like any of my friend groups. Like everyone else is like, Rachel Gloria, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> I'm just like, what's a bean, you know? Um, oh, so, really? <laughs> beans are so easy that you just get cans of beans and just like a white, two cans of a cannellini beans, rinse them off and then like brown some sausage in a pan, uh, uh -huh. add the beans, add like a little like lemon juice or garlic or whatever and then just add the kale at the end and stir it all together some salt that, that sounds great okay maybe maybe i will do that if i can uh you know uh, <laughs> muster up the courage to go to the grocery store but yeah so something with kale is my answer but what, what's on the menu for you today oh you you love you are a journalist you do, you know, do love right? to turn the tables well I'm, so i'm doing this broadway cookbook where i'm mm -hmm. working with a broadway actor and every recipe is a pun and right. I'm not supposed to reveal the dishes before the book comes out because it spoils the fun of it. But tonight, do you know the musical Godspell? I don't. I, so even though I'm gay, I like yeah. don't like musicals very much. Um, I, I, I feel really like you're you're like a subcategory out there. I've already met a couple of you gay people right. who are like not that excited about my cookbook, but that's okay. No, um, no, 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 no. I didn't say <laughs> it's about your cookbook. Your cookbook. <laughs> no, I mean it's okay. Yeah. I, I'm a person who loves actors, though. So like, uh, that's, okay. that's the kind of thing that I that I actually really like vibe with, you know, the spirit of your book. It's just the songs are aware. Yeah. Well, <laughs> anyway, for God spell, I'm going to make cod spells. So I have to cook mm. with cod tonight. Oh, I, I feel like if you hate musicals and you hate puns, you are going to hate this cookbook. But no, no, if, no. You, if you are even a little bit open to it, I think it's going to be for you. Yeah, no, I mean, I think I, I will actually like it because I have kind of like, I don't know if it really came through in this conversation, but I do have some like, dad humor um you know kind of bones in me so i think Good. that i would very much appreciate the puns and of course if you team me up with you know various actors you know then uh, yeah. that, that that sounds like it'd be right up my alley but no the only like musicals i really like are like the depressing ones like a pennies from heaven if you've ever seen that it's no funny. and i love steve martin and bernadette peters and i can't believe i've never seen it it's so i mean they are both amazing in it like bernadette peters is just like just blows my mind in that movie that's um, so funny i've never heard anybody recommend it but when i was a kid i would see it at the blockbuster and be like what is this maybe i should oh it's, this. it's yeah. so damn good it's beautiful i love that cabaret uh yeah tommy tommy's pretty it's just wacky i don't even know if it's depressing oh my god that scene speaking of beans do you remember that scene in tommy where ann margaret Who could forget yeah yeah in an Oscar nominated performance, which I covered just, I in baked beans in a white room. That's that, that haunted me my whole childhood. I'll never forget that. It is an unforgettable image. So yeah, no, but I love Tommy, but <laughs> well, you might, you must get asked this all the time. So we'll end on this and I'm sure you have your answer, but what are your favorite food movies? Oh, my favorite food movies. Oh man. Because I was like, okay, well I'm ready to answer what my favorite movies are. Oh God. Oh, nobody okay. cares about that. This is a food podcast that right, people I know. are very oh, passionate goodness. about. Yeah. I got to get that like version of my brain on. Yeah. Um, good question. You know, I should have kind of a rehearsed answer to this, but you haven't written a column yet about like your favorite scenes from like food scenes. I have. Movie. Yeah. You know, I did um, write a piece in 2019 that was all about like redefining what the food movie is or whatever, because you know, everyone like, Everyone likes to circulate the same names, like Babette's Feast, Tampopo, et cetera, yeah, yeah. Big Night. And like, these are all, you know, good to great movies. Um, but I'm like, but, you know, we can kind of expand our definition of the food movie a bit, you know, because it's not just about like providing sensory pleasure or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but I'm trying to think of the uh, movies that I include in them. <laughs> you know, speaking <laughs> of depressing movies, you know, I mean, like, there's Jean Dielman by uh, Chantal Ackerman, which I think is a food movie because it's so much about like women's labor. But I don't, I can't say that that watching that movie is like a pleasurable experience because it's very <laughs> long and you know it's um yeah. very like procedural. But um I appreciate it as kind of a document. Um, there's another movie called Grave of the Fireflies, um, which mm -hmm. is like a Studio Ghibli movie. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's not directed by uh, Miyazaki. It's directed by his contemporary uh, Isao Takahata. Um, passed away a few years ago, but it's an incredibly depressing movie um, about two siblings during World War II. But I think that the way that Isao Takahata treats food in that movie and just like the lack of access to food ultimately and what it does to these um, you know, children is so moving and so effective. Um, I know that so many people love to talk about how beautifully like Miyazaki's movies um, treat food because, you know, they, they make you so hungry. But I think mm -hmm. that this um, 
this movie is the one that really stands out to me from like the studio Ghibli kind of. I'm going to watch that. I just yeah. watched um, Spirited It Away again. And I don't think I appreciated it enough the first time, but watching it this time, I loved it. I felt, I literally felt spirited away. Like I just, oh, during, yeah. the, during the pandemic, I was just like, oh, I'm in this magical place now. It's so it's nice. Gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's a masterpiece, but I think uh, Girl of the Fireflies is really like, it's it's incredible. And like, you yeah, love you your depressing movies. Yeah. You like I sad know. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to think of like happy movies that I have. Like. You ever seen um beaches of course i have oh my god i'm i'm like the ultimate barbara hershey stan so i not a bed midler stan oh, of course i love bed midler but you know i think that like barbara hershey she's kind of like underrated you know she i think that she's i don't want to characterize her as like a character actress because she of course had lead roles um you know many times in her career but i think that she's the kind of like hardworking talent who doesn't get as much love as she deserves. Um, like she only has like one Oscar nod and like, she's so good in a movie like Black Swan where like she oh, doesn't yeah. have to be as good as she is, if that makes sense, you know? Um, Beaches but... is the only movie that truly makes me sob despite like how cheesy it all is. Like it's so cheesy and so manipulative, but that last, at the end of the movie, spoiler alert, when like the, the Barbara Hershey's daughter like hates Bed Midler and like they oh hate each God. other and then like she, I'm getting like choked up now and then then Barbara Hershey like collapses and like is mm -hmm. dead and then like she runs in and sees her mom dead and then Bed Midler has to it's like yeah. oh my God turn on the waterworks I'm it's sobbing totally it works so well like yeah. in a way that other movies like like Steel Magnolias for example yeah. does not totally work on me in that same way you know yeah. I think that beaches is really effective at just you know kind of appealing to that you know the lowest common denominator <laughs> that makes sense you know that's but, me yeah. that's me yeah no no same. <laughs> I, love, I love it for that reason like yeah. ridiculous movie but whatever i, I went it. to um edinburgh with craig for the edinburgh film festival and Amazing. when we were wandering around there we found a bar called cc blooms which oh, was named shit. after Ben Midler's character in the gay district there. And it was incredible. so exciting. And I just um, remember, wasn't Maya Bialik the young uh, yes. Ben Midler in that movie? Yeah. Totally. Wow. Yeah. Now she's hosting Jeopardy. Who knew? Uh, oh. Well, yeah. <laughs> Mayuk, this was so nice to finally meet you. I think we had a great therapy session. Likewise, I feel rejuvenated. I feel like I have a better understanding of myself and my relationship with food after this. So thank you. I hope so. Much. Yeah, me too. Um, well, let, let's hang out when I'm in New York uh, at the end of July. Yes, please. Let me know when you're here. And I hope that you have a nice uh, intermittent fasting break. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks. <soon. laughs> yeah, I know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go run on a treadmill now and then have a smoothie. Oh my God. Okay. Jesus Christ. Okay. I know. I, I'm losing the quarantine weight. I gained like 20 pounds. So like I'm gonna drop it and then we're gonna be good totally okay <laughs> well anyway so i'll see you much skinnier i'll be much skinnier in a couple of weeks so i'll talk to you Perfect. then All amazing right. thank, thank you thank you bye